It is my very great pleasure to welcome today Ruth Lightman, director of the fantastic documentary Lipstick and Dynamite, The First Ladies of Wrestling. Ruth, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks for having me here. Ruth, I've seen the film about three times now and it really is such a fantastic insight into an historical era. And I read here though that you're not actually a wrestling fan yourself. So what inspired you to make the film? Well, I was inspired to make the film uh, after I learned that there were lady wrestlers way back as, as early as the 30s from a friend of mine who worked in professional wrestling. I had a friend named Marlene Sopel Stewart who worked for wrestling, world championship wrestling in Atlanta, Georgia. And she took a, a car ride with Harry Funk between Amarillo and Lubbock, Texas. And along the way, they picked up Kay Noble. And Kay Noble though she wasn't one of the original Golden Girl wrestlers, connected us to to many of the women that you see in the film. Right, right, okay. I was really interested in their in their road stories, the fact that they came from some very difficult and challenging home lives and that they used basically a culture of wrestling and fighting and violence as a way to um, get out and see the country and parlay that into a career in sports. Yeah, because they really spent a lot of time touring. Um, you know, they sort of just in, t- in towns day after day after day as they go along, wouldn't they? They would. And also at the time, men wrestled in territories and they would stay in the same place for, for quite a while, at least a few months. And, you know, a man could sort of, the male wrestlers could sort of settle in for a while. And the girls would really do a lot of one-night stands where they would, you know, go to a town, wrestle, get back into the car, drive another couple hundred miles, get a little bit of sleep, do a little TV in the morning, and then keep going. And it was a, it was really difficult. It was a tough road life. Yeah, I, I have to wonder how much of the countryside they actually got to see well, on such a you know tight schedule. They're just always having to either sleeping or they're doing the TV or they're wrestling. Well, it's like Ella Waldeck says. We were, the, we were like just... It was, we were like sailors seeing the world through a porthole. That you know, you got into a car, you drove into a town, you saw the arena and the room you were staying in, and then you got back in the car and drove to your next place. Yeah, they saw it. From, they saw it moving. They saw the countryside moving. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that you've uh, become a fan of professional wrestling since the film, or do you think that today's product is just so far removed from the era of the film as to be incomparable? Well, it's it's really removed, although there are some similarities, and you know the genesis of it comes from this era and a lot of the a lot of the the wrestling moves and holds and strategies um, are the same. I think, and I think that 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 often the entertainment aspects of it, you know, had origins from that same time. There is. I'm interested in wrestling today, perhaps more as a sociologist. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think I think it's fascinating. I think that the characters are fascinating, and um, I don't know. I think it's sort of the precursor to reality television. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's actually no, that's actually true. Um, have you met any of the um, when you were making the film? Um, I noticed some footage of of today's women uh, wrestlers. Did you get to meet any of them or talk to them while you were making the film? I did. Um, we met Molly Holly. Yeah. Um, she was at a book signing for the fabulous Mula. I met her back then. And then um, when the film premiered in New York, Molly Holly, Victoria, and Ivory all came. And that was really great because I think um, to a certain degree, you know, Moolin may have a relationship with them because yeah. they still work with um, the WWE. But the other wrestlers, I think, it's, I think that they're being there to sort of, sort of demystified them a little bit. And it was really great to see them paying homage to Gladys Killam Gillum and to say, yeah. you know, we we really appreciate that you paved the way for us because I think that the, the ladies in the film really felt forgotten and that and that. Um, that no one really acknowledged them. And I think that by making the film and by having the modern wrestlers come and support the film, that they were supporting um, their contribution to the sport. And just as a reminder that these women have been the absolute pioneers 
for you know for the modern wrestling for women's wrestling now. You know they they went through um, they had to break down all those barriers. Yeah, and I think these you know um, Victoria and Ivory said it very very succinctly that night. They they thanked them for for paving the way and 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 I think that even with them you know very very shortly after that I think Molly Holly left and yeah yeah she has which is a shame really because she had been one of the um you know one of the the better talents as far as women go in the product today actually I think Molly Holly I think all three of them are and um they were very gracious and um you know, when we were when the film opened in Canada, Ella Waldeck and Ida Martinez were doing a morning talk show on Breakfast T V and they were being they happened to be that the WWE was in town and Kurt Angle and uh, Don Marie. Don Marie, okay. Yeah. Right. It was it was also being let go. Yeah. Yeah. But Chris Engel and, and Don Marie were following Ellen Waldeck and Ida Mae Martinez on this talk show, and they were such a tough act to follow that they had to talk about them, and they had to talk about, you know, the things that the women wrestlers had to do at that time and how skilled they were. Cause they really were skilled, and I think that that that, that really the, the wrestlers today that are really good at what they do, um, that have that have sort of done their homework and and understand, you know, the, you know, the genesis of their sport. No, this is women really work hard. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so that was really nice, and it was nice for them to get that, that sort of acknowledgement. Yeah. The women that were featured in your documentary are legends to almost all wrestling scenes, especially the fabulous Mola, great Mae Young, Penny Banner, and... The fans are, of course, familiar with their public personalities. Did you find that their real-life personas were similar to what the fans had been used to seeing? I mean, especially in, in um, you know, Moolah and May. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting how, um, you know, with an actor, when you see an actor on a talk show, um, the actor is really that person. They're the person. They're not the character that they're playing. And I think that... In the in the world of wrestling, and probably starting with these women and and their contemporaries, their, the men that were their their contemporaries, you know, like Classy Freddie Blassie and um, Gorgeous George, etc. It's almost like um, they have they they are that persona 24/7, and that that those personalities that it, that it's really hard to sort of get beneath that to see underneath that. It was it was questioned to me, you know, for a long time. Why did you not make this film just about Mula? And and first of all, I felt like Mula, a lot of people already know about Mula. Oh yeah. Um, you know, they've known about her for years, and and a lot of these other wrestlers. Um, I I really wanted their stories to be told, but also I think there's that idea that 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 just in terms of making a film that that it's so important for the characters. Change. And Mula doesn't really change. And she, this is really who she is. And if I were making a film about Lillian Ellison, that's very different. Because Lillian Ellison is a very sweet southern woman. Yeah, it's a, and it's very different to the to the Mula. She cannot help. She cannot help but be Mula. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and. Uh, um, the same for Mae Young, I really noticed in the film that she, um, you know, she had said that she had had a heel persona right through her career, right up until now. Do you think that much of that has carried over into her genuine, into her, you know, personality as well? I do. Mae Young is a really interesting one in that having watched, you know, match after match from that time, you know, just sort of going through all of the archival footage, I really believe that of the earliest wrestlers, Mae Young was probably one of the best. And she and she didn't win. But well, they know the heels didn't win, did they? Either. <laughs> no, no, not her. And you know, I think that there are various reasons for that. Some of the heels won back then. 
but not not May, May Young didn't win very often. And um, I was looking at, um, oh, especially some of the battle royals where they were all working on. They were all they were all working very hard together to get her out first. Yeah, and she would always be the last one in there. Really? Because it, because it wasn't a title. Yeah. It was a battle royal. Yeah. It was a, it was an attraction, and um and she was tough, but she was such a great show show woman. She was, and she she um and she just I mean it it is very much like she says in the film. She loves the business so much. She loves putting on a great show, and she just had this incredible tough devil may care bravado that that um that I just enjoy about her so much. Definitely. You were saying when, uh, when we were talking before you were saying that they had you know that they've seemed to come from fairly tough backgrounds and that the wrestling was a way for them to sort of break out and see some of the country. Do you think that it was also a factor in choosing to break down some of the stereotypes in a time, you know, where, sorry, and what was, and, and it's very much still as a man's world. I mean, wrestling, even now, is still very much a man's sport. And back then, with the advent of World War II, do you think that the women were breaking down these stereotypes in all sorts of ways and not just wrestling? You know, I, this, this is something that comes up a lot for me. And I, I, I am a feminist filmmaker I'm a feminist as, as, a, as a woman and I'm, I'm a feminist filmmaker and I and a lot of the films that I make are about very strong women and that was something that I talked to them about a lot and I think I would love to believe that they were it, it, they were uh, they were very um, that they were uh, very consciously trying to break down a stereotype but in fact they were really working towards surviving and the fact that they did that along the way they now reflect back on and they say wow we did this thing and the only thing that i that i would say is um and because i really try not to impose my views on my subjects and i, I asked them about this so many times and ella waldeck actually said you know because i talked to her about being a feminist and to try to and and was she trying to break down the stereotypes and she says in such a humorous way. She says, you know, are you talking about women's lib? I wasn't burning my bra <laughs> to hold me up. <laughs> and that that they were able to break down certain stereotypes and to look and to look back later and say they really did something. The one thing that they did was when all of the territories and I don't I don't know what this was like, what was what was how this was in, in New Zealand and I don't know how early the girls came there. I know that I know that a lot of the girls came to Australia in the late fifties, early sixties. But um one of the things happened in the States is that there were territories that were shutting down because the athletic commissioner thought that it was lewd and and the women went to the the individual states and worked very hard to try to get their states opened up. And the reason that the, the athletic commissioners could not prevent them from wrestling was on the auspices that you could not prevent a woman from making a living at her chosen profession. Right. It was their chosen profession. Yeah. And so inadvertently, they ended up doing this. But, but they all have reflected back to me that they were not trying to save for other women and for this, this you know, which, which, um, which, which fascinates me, I think, because a lot of times um, women in the working class who use their bodies in their work are often sort of dismissed as, oh, they're not really feminist, they're not, you know, this is sort of less than acceptable, a sort of less than acceptable career for a woman. And in fact, they were, they were, I mean, they were probably in, in its heyday in the 50s. There were no more than 50 of these women. So it's, it's, despite the fact that they, that they weren't trying to, you know, they weren't trying to be feminist or to pave the way, they were just, they were working really hard at making a living, they still inadvertently um, did become pioneers. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
and despite the huge novelty of women's wrestling back then, um, and I saw in your film that it was actually banned in some states. Do, do you really think that society found them that much of a threat? I think so. I think that, you know, it was perceived in certain places like it was burlesque. I know that in Canada they were taxed very high for doing this and they had to wear, they had to wear tights that, you know, basically covered them from head to toe. From neck to neck to ankle. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Now the, the early days of women's wrestling, it, the one that really came across in the film um, was dominated. Seems to be by um, Billy Wolf, the promoter. It really seemed to me like his stable of wrestlers just was very closely characterised to his own personal harem. How true would you say that was? I would say that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Um, he is a very intriguing character to me, um, and um, you know he basically had a monopoly on. He, he controlled all of the girl wrestlers for a, a long time until, well, until his wife decided to do it and leave him and decided to have her own troop of wrestlers. But um, yes, yeah, so it was it was very much like that, and um, I think that the bookings that the girls got. Um, depended on what their relationship was to him. You know, I know that Mae Young was never involved with him in that way, but she got really good bookings because she was um, really good. Yeah, just genuinely a really big draw card because she was so talented. And I would say the same of Ella Waldeck and, uh, you know, for a lot of the original. Penny Banner is a little younger, started a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. Some of the women in the film seem to have a kind of a cynical nostalgia for the old days. Do you think that any of them have found it difficult to let go of their wrestling characters, of of that way of life? I think so. I mean, if you're referring to the other ones besides Moolah and May, I and May, I think they're probably very much the exception in that they definitely have not let go of, of their characters. But yeah, I, I was I was referring to the others. Right, because Mullen, Mullen may still work. I think that now, reflecting back, um, I think that that really, like any elderly person, sort of reflecting back on 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 their life. If you look back at your life and you've done something that's really unique, and it helped to shape you as a young adult, it is really hard to get rid of that, to lose that. And I think that that they all have that, and each one of their lives, you know, some some worked out better than others. I mean, Ida was able to to um, eventually go to college and nursing school and become a nurse, and I think that she takes a certain amount of pride in that. But they're all entertainers underneath of it all, and, and I think that because they each only had their 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of fame, if you want to, if you will, um, I think all of them... We're all looking for that again. We're all looking yeah. for um, to be acknowledged and and some sort of comeback in a way. There's all I think I think that's true of of a lot of sports figures in in a sense looking for for that rematch. Yeah. Um, you were saying before about uh, Ida Marzen that she'd gone on to become a nurse. I was very proud of that. Um, Penny Banner went on to become a successful Olympian, senior Olympian. Um, which was, you know, which was really, it was great to see that, you know, to see that they could um, evolve into something else other than um, professional wrestlers. What do you think differentiates um, the women like Ida Martinez and Penny Banner from Moolah and May, who are still working for WWE? I don't know. I guess I sort of question um, if they had all been in that same position, would they have done that? the same. I don't, I guess I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess Gladys would. Gladys, you know, Gladys would love to be out there if she could at 86. (laughs) She's so incredible. Um, I think Ida knows that, that it's really dangerous and would not want that. Um, And I think that Ella Ella feels the same. Penny, I'm not so sure. I mean, because Penny's still uh, still an athlete. Um, 
I think the thing that separates, I mean, for Moolah and May, I mean, they just live and breathe the business. And really, I think a lot of it's the show business part of it. And they have um, very deep-seated relationships with with all of the people in wrestling that have followed them. And um, they live for it. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that that struck me forcibly was was their little companion, Diamond Lil, Katie, who who lives with them. Um, she was being prompted on everything she said by Mula. Was that for real on the camera, or is she really that dependent? One of the things that I learned after making the film is that, um, you know, I mean, they're a family, and so, I mean, especially in these days, you know, there's all sorts of families all sorts of combinations of people make up families. I really see them as a family. And I learned later that that Moolah really saved Diamond Will from a very difficult home life when she went on the road with her to become a wrestler. And I think that Katie is really, really devoted to her. Yeah. And um, it's a relationship and a family that really works. And... In the film, certainly in the beginning of the film, it comes off as this really odd thing. But hopefully when you, you walk away with the fact that um, there's there's um, friendship there that's very deep, it is sort of this really odd-seeming relationship. But at the end of the day, it's the, it's the dedication and devotion to each other. And as you say, all sorts of people make up families. Yes. Women's wrestling, when it first began, seemed to me to be a sort of a strange paradox, you know. And they talked about this in the film. Outside the ring, you know, they had to be perfectly groomed with their nails done. Uh, they had great physical beauty. And yet, when they got in the ring, they turned around, they were tough, and they really they could kick some serious butt. Do you think that this stark contrast was one of the features that made women's wrestling so popular? I absolutely do. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was the um, that to the audience there was this um, duality of powerful and glamorous at the same time, like this this meanness and beauty that made them so um, intriguing. And one of the things that you see, um, you know, in order to make the film more exciting, you know, I tried to use audience footage where they were engaged. But oftentimes, you know, a lot of the wrestling, in a lot of the wrestling footage I have, the audience is really demure and sedate. And just, I mean, and a lot of, a lot of the audience was, um, was women. It was almost like there were, it, it was this way for women to live vicariously, you know, at, by watching women do things that they couldn't imagine themselves doing. And um, and I think that 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 was part of the intrigue for women, and then for men, I think that there was um, the sort of um, titillation factor, and and you know it was very I don't know attractive and somewhat subversive to see you know women being so tough out there and being so beautiful and. That's something that they really hang on, um, that we were ladies, we, were, we presented ourselves as ladies, and, and um, that's something that they're really proud of. Um, and as a matter of fact, they make that distinction. I think they refer to themselves as ladies and girls as opposed to women. Yes, I noticed that um, definitely the ladies and girls um, definition of themselves uh, but they they were absolutely, that is how I would have characterized them. They looked like they had just stepped off the pages of a fashion magazine, you know, when they were outside the ring. And yet when they were inside the ring, it was a, it was such a strange turnaround, but at the same time really compelling to watch. But there's one really big difference in, in how they deal with their fans. Like after a match, they get dressed up back into their suits, you know, they're in very nice suits and hose and heels and fix their hair. And then they come out and sign an autograph with their fans and be very nice to them. There wasn't a lot of, like, 
yelling and screaming back and forth and 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 tag. there wasn't they would you know that they would antagonize with their fans while they were in the ring but when they were done they were very it was a lot more gracious sort of like going to see you know Frank Sinatra after a show or Judy Garland after a show and you know there would be an autograph signing and and people would be you know very reserved and pleasant. It seems to me that they had a grace and a dignity that maybe is lacking in the product today, especially as far as women's wrestlers go. Yeah, I, w- I would say I would say that too. But you know, those things are manufactured. Yeah. High above in the corporation. Yeah. Yeah. Rach, you mentioned that you were inspired to make two films, one of which was this documentary. Can you tell us anything about your second project? I have a script that um, that is set in 1950 um, that is based on some of the things that I learned while making this documentary and um, that I hope to get produced this year. It's called The Pin Down Girl. That sounds like a really good film. It would be great to see that. Good luck with that. Thank you very much. And I'm I'm really hoping. I mean, there's great roles for women in it, so um, I'm really hoping to get it to get it produced this year because I think that um, that I found a missing piece of sports of women's of really of women's history that I that I wanted to see. Um, you know, represented out there, and there were stories that that really couldn't be told in the documentary properly, and um, so I'm hoping to get this made this year. I wish you all the very best of luck with that. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Christy. I appreciate it. Well, I just wanted to take this, take this opportunity to express my very great appreciation for agreeing to talk with us today. Uh, your film is just a wonderful insight into one of the most colourful and flamboyant eras of professional wrestling. Uh, it really is a must-see for any wrestling fan. It'll be released on DVD in September of this year, is that right? That's right. And I'm hoping that it's going to be in theaters in New Zealand sometime soon because I know that there is a great thirst and interest for wrestling in New Zealand, and I hope I hope it's there soon. Absolutely. So do we. So do we. Ruth, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you so much for the film. Thanks, Christy.